So I will very, very quickly introduce to us, like I mentioned earlier, uh, one um, a representative from our partner organization. So we will be welcoming Winnie Munene, the local patient safety lead at Boringo Inglerheim to give us a very quick goodwill message. Winnie, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Adara, and uh, welcome to all our participants, all the partners around the table. Uh, we're very honored for you to accept our invitation. So as Adara has rightly introduced me, I'm Winnie Munene, based out of Nairobi, Kenya. I work for Boringa Ingelheim uh, as a local patient safety lead for Sub-Saharan Africa. And therefore, I'm very excited uh, to finally have this first PISA session uh, with everyone participating around Africa and even around the world. What we are mainly trying to drive here is patient safety awareness and sensitization. Obviously, the conversation starting with the healthcare professionals and eventually to be cascaded as well to the patient so that they would know what to report to their healthcare providers. Uh, Wale, if you, if you could go to the next slide. So what is just important to note here is uh, the patient safety and pharmacovigilance uh, function at BI is re resident in the one medicine, and this is a medicine function. And we are supporting uh, a different um, um, workflows and, and in terms of clinical trials, uh, as well as post-market surveillance, and looking at um, the products that are in the market are giving a, a higher benefit versus risk to our patients and to the people who are actually using them in the market. Uh, Wale, if you go to the next slide. Uh, what's important for me to reiterate is that Ringa Ingelheim and the patient safety department has a PV vision. And what we clearly came out with is that the patient is our focus in all our operations, processes, and our day-to-day. -day. We are striving to be patient-centric. And on top of that, we are developing communication packages regarding patient safety because we down to HCPs and eventually patients. And this is our main objective, why we are congregated here today. Uh, we want to create a conversation, a discussion with the different stakeholders and eventually the information um, being made palatable uh, down to the patient. Uh, next slide, Wale. What's important to note is that uh, Bringa Engelheim sees themselves as a patient safety leader and uh, we are focused on the patient all the way from early development uh, through clinical practice, and this is after marketing, post-marketing. Uh, and also we have committed to drive digital and technological innovation so that we can transform the way patients' uh, safety is being shaped across the industry around the world. Um, What's, in, what's again uh, important to note here, uh, from a BI perspective, we have an unwavering commitment to the patient and we are integrating patient safety in the very fabric of everything that we do at BI. And we're not saying that only for today, but we are talking about tomorrow and beyond because we think about generations when you're doing anything at BI. We think about future generations, we think about sustainability. Um, and in my last slide, um, just to just to reiterate, um, I think it's important that when we speak about patient safety, uh, let's not consider it as a far uh, issue that we are talking about. Wale, it would be the next slide. Uh, the patient could be you, it could be me, it could be our families, it could be our friends. So the conversation that we discussed today, let's try to really bring it home because at the end of the day, when we connect with something emotionally, we take it more um, seriously and we have it top of mind. So important to note here is that the patient safety is not expensive, it's priceless. And this is what BI is committing in terms of communicating around this and creating awareness and sensitization. And the strongest drug that exists for a human being is another human being. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the session and I hope we can continue to congregate and, and continue with this discussion on patient safety. Thank you and Thank over you. back to you, Adara. Thank you so much, Winnie. Indeed, the strongest drug that exists for a human 
is another human being. That is very profound. Thank you so much for that introduction. So we will go very quickly to run through some of the partners who are, are part of this particular session. I had mentioned earlier MDoc. MDoc is a digital health company that optimizes the end-to-end -end self care support for people living with regular or chronic health needs. We do this across various pillars, one of which is our complete health platform that provides support, a, a virtual bespoke support for people with regular and chronic health needs. We have health coaches, it's a, coach, a health coach led multidisciplinary team um, of members who will support you through that journey. You can register using the link um, there. We also have, of course, the tele-education piece, which is why we are here. And another partner is the CDMS team, um, like I like to call them, my, one of my Kayan families. They are, they are the chronic drugs medical scheme. And the goal of CDMS is to provide accessibility, is to improve accessibility and affordability of medication. Um, it's, they use digital solutions and strategic partnerships to do this but, um, and improve health outcomes in low income countries. We also have um, another brother, uh, another brother of mine from Kenya. I think at this point I will have um, many, many relatives in Kenya, as well as other African countries as we, as we go along. Jacaranda Maternity, whose goal um, is to provide high quality, low cost and respectful maternity services in East Africa. Welcome to everyone just joining us. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. So we will start, I had mentioned that we have um, we have representative from regulatory agencies, both in Nigeria and in Kenya. And to kick us off, we will be hearing from Dr. Martha Mandile, who is a regulatory officer with the Pharmacy and Poisons Board in Kenya. She will be speaking around guidelines, recommendations around um, patient safety and pharmacovigilance. Over to you, Martha. Thank you, Adeora, for this uh, wonderful opportunity um, to speak to our healthcare workers, both uh, from Kenya and uh, Nigeria, about uh, pharmacovigilance, uh, what system is in place as, uh, you know, the regulatory uh, perspective, and uh, what is expected uh, of them just to ensure uh, that we enhance patient safety. So I'll take you through what the definition of pharmacovigilance uh, is. So pharmacovigilance basically is uh, the science and all activities uh, relating to uh, the detection, assessment, understanding, and prevention of adverse events. And this is a uh, definition by uh, WHO uh, 2002. Uh, of course, pharmacovigilance comes is derived from two words, pharmacon in Greek meaning uh, drug, and uh, vigilare uh, in Latin meaning uh, to keep watch. So what is expected of us as healthcare workers is that when we receive these patients at our healthcare facilities and uh, they've come with symptoms and we suspect that it is an adverse uh, event or adverse drug reactions because of um, exposure to a medicine or a vaccine, we expect that we manage them, but uh, also ensure that we do uh, document and um, uh, do uh, the reporting uh, so that that data, the, you know, at the pharmacovigilance uh, center, which is housed by the uh, National Medicines Regulatory Authority in Kenya, that is PPB, uh, we are able to understand this data better. We are able to do analysis so that we have evidence-based uh, uh, decision-making in terms of, uh, you know, form, uh, policy and, and how uh, better to prevent uh, such events or adverse reactions of patients. So what you see on your screen right now uh, is basically the guidelines that we have in Kenya uh, that speak to pharmacovigilance. So uh, there's the main national PV guideline, the, the middle one, the guidelines on the safety and vigilance of medical products and health technologies, because we appreciate pharmacovigilance is just not about uh, picking areas for medicines, but also events can occur when we use our medical uh, devices. Medical devices are actually the gloves, the syringes uh, we are using, the masks we are currently using, uh, uh, you know, for prevention of COVID-19. And so, uh, um, it's, it's pharmacovigilance is basically uh, holistic. The blue uh, guideline yeah, speaks to adverse events following 
uh, immunization. So I know most of us have received, no, if not all, the COVID-19 vaccine. So it basically uh, tells us on how to go uh, about uh, the AEFIs, uh, including a reporting and management of our patients. The first green guideline is basically uh, guidelines for the establishment of uh, the qualified person for pharmacovigilance. And uh, that one uh, only applies to the marketing authorization holders because the kind of reports that we receive not, are not only from the healthcare workers, but also from the marketing authorization uh, holders. Next slide. Slide, please. So what you can see there is uh, the reporting tools that we use uh, in Kenya. We do appreciate uh, that the scope of pharmacovigilance uh, uh, is, is expanding so that it's not just on adverse drug reactions, but medication uh, errors, uh, suspected poor quality. And so those forms in the previous uh, slide, those forms um, actually are the ones that we use in Kenya uh, for reporting either suspected poor quality products or um, adverse events. Uh, following immunization, medication errors, and adverse drug reactions. So that slide went on quickly, but uh, we are good. Right now, you can see the flow of uh, safety information. So from, you know, uh, as we go, we are also appreciating that um, the public out there have so much information uh, on medicines. So sometimes they do uh, report directly to the pharmacy and poisons board through the electronic uh, system. Uh, and, and sometimes they also go through you uh, at the facilities, whether it is the public or private health uh, facilities so that you do uh, the reporting on their behalf. So that flow goes all the way. And until now we, we share the, 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 the information, the safety information of the WHO uh, UMC. Uh, on this other side also, uh, we get uh, reports also from wholesalers and retail outlets. We get uh, reports from national referral hospitals, private FBOs, NGO facilities. Sometimes we use Sentinel sites, like now we have targeted spontaneous reporting of COVID-19 vaccines. We get safety information from clinical trials, from public health programs, and also from the pharma uh, industry. And of course, as uh, this, the reports come to us, the feedback is expected also from us. So this is our uh, pharmacovigilance electronic uh, reporting system. Uh, we have had it um, uh, since uh, 2009. And so uh, recently we have upgraded it, uh, 2021. And so the URL uh, link up there is, is what you use uh, for the Kenya um, you know, healthcare workers, you access it. And all the forms that uh, have been shown in the previous slides, you can actually uh, do the reporting directly uh, on this uh, platform. Next slide. One minute more, one minute more, Dr. Marcus. Yes, next slide. Um, this is just public sensitization. So even as we sensitize you, we also reach out to the public using the social media platform. And we have a dedicated line uh, there, the 0795743049, where the public can actually reach us. And we are actually developing the USSD code so that this enhances public reporting. Next slide. So this is just to appreciate how far we have come. So uh, these are the reports that we have received uh, so far. And you can see the trend is actually going upwards. We are not yet there, uh, but then this is why we're doing this uh, sensitization. Thank you. Next slide, I think should be the last one. So what we usually say in Kenya is that you do not need to be certain. You only need to be suspicious that this medicine, this drug, this um, uh, medical device, this uh, vaccine could be responsible uh, for this event or this, uh, you know, adverse reaction. So we usually uh, require that the healthcare workers uh, report to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Martha. Thank you so, so much. So we'll be moving to our next presenter, again, from a regulatory agency in Nigeria, the National Agency for Food and Drug Control, Administration and Control, NAFDAC. In Nigeria, we'll be hearing from Mr. Frandin Beatrice, who will be walking us through um, pharmacovigilance in the health facilities in Nigeria. Over to you, Mr. Beatrice, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, Adora. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. 
Yes, so I will be presenting on the pharmacovigilance in the health facilities in Nigeria. So let's go on the next. Can we have the next slide? Yes, so um, Martha has just uh, discussed about the def definition, so there's no need for me to go through it because it's universal. So next one. Uh, actually, what I just want to state here is that pharmacovigilance actually is a you know, it's one of the steps that needs to be taken to, uh, to guarantee patient safety. Next slide. Uh, usually the, the issue of you need to have a legal framework in order to work. You don't just go into just um, pharmacovigilance. There has to be a, 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 a legal framework, you know, in the country in order to give you the right to actually go into it. And this is what has given NAVDAC the right, you know, to go into it. And, um, and uh, so this mandates, this the legal right actually mandates NAVDAC to ensure the quality, safety, and efficacy of the above of, of um, uh, products like um, the, the food, um, the drugs, cosmetics, and detergents. You know, whether imported, manufactured locally, or uh, distributed and advertised. Next slide. Okay, so this is how the setup is, the system, the national system is. We have the National Pharmacovigilance Center, and we have uh, the Drug um, Safety, uh, drug, National Drug Safety Advisory Committee, which this is a group of experts that, um, you know, from all that we do, uh, we may get to, to, to areas where we, we cannot take decision on our own. So we may need the input of experts who may not necessarily be uh, working, with, uh, working in NAVDAC, but they are out there, both academicians and practitioners. Then we have, of course, what, what we get, we also, make available to the society through the Food and Drug Information Center. Um, next slide. And this uh, next slide will tell you the different stakeholders. Uh, pharmacovigilance is about inputs, uh, processes, and then outcomes. So we have you know, uh, information coming from the facilities where uh, people are administered uh, medications and when they react, so we collect data from there and we make that data also available to other uh, people who will need to, to, to use them, like the like WHO, like Upsala uh, uh, Monitoring Center, you know, which, which houses the data for the all nations. So you may also want to dive into that to also get information. Next slide. Next slide. So this is the scope. It covers drugs, medical devices, vaccines, chemicals, herbals, and cosmetics. Next slide. Uh, the roles of the facilities in pharmacovigilance. Like I said earlier, uh, pharmacovigilance has to do with structures, has to do with processes, and then the outcomes. Now in the, in, in the structures, the facilities where medications are administered, these are the structures. These are one of the part of the structures. So it is from here that we get our data. You know, people come there for medications and they are administered and they react to it. You give us information, we work on the information and we know, you know it becomes, uh, and it, it better, you know, the, the, the lives of the people. So, and the next slide is actually supposed to be talking about the reference document. And the reference documents that we have has to do with the national policy. You know, government is involved. So government uh, has to come up with a roadmap, a, a, a kind of a, a policy as about well how to work and how to achieve this and achieve it, you know, well. We also have the good uh, pharmacovigilance practice guidelines you know, for the industry, how they uh, need to report, how they need to set professionals should 
professionals should report willingly. They should consider it an ethical responsibility, you know, obligation to actually report. While, you know, the, the, the industry is mandatory, it is their product. So they need to monitor and get information and report so that it can better, you know, patients uh, who will continue to use such products. Now the pharmacovigilance reporting can also be passive or active. Uh, like um, when we, where we have cohort event monitoring, where people sit and practically, you know, monitor the patients, you know, you know, holistically ensuring that every um, incident is captured. That's active while passive is, like I said, in the facilities, an ethical responsibility. Now the other um, reporting tools that we have, we have guidelines, you know, for both um, practitioners, um, industry, and then the reporting form. We also have the e-reporting tools, like the uh, the one that is on the website, the e-reporting uh, ADR reporting. Then we have the Med Safety app. It's also um, very, very I mean, useful. Uh, now that on using the Med Safety app, our reports, our report, our reports has increased astronomically. You know, from probably um, where we used to have less than 1,000 in a year, I think within this year alone, we have over 14,000 reports that has actually come in. Uh, funding, of course, funding is actually a problem, and uh, but it is clearly spelled in the uh, policy that government at all levels should sponsor pharmacovigilance. Setting up pharmacovigilance unit in all the facilities uh, so that they can report, you know, for, um, uh, adverse drug reactions, adverse events um, um, following immunizations, and even the one that has to do with medical devices, vaccines, and, and, and co. So in conclusion, pharmacovigilance is an important dis discipline which should be integrated into the healthcare system to ensure safe and rational use of medicine. A holistic approach is recommended in the implementation of the activities to cover the entire scope of pharmacovigilance and the pharmaceutical products in all tiers of the healthcare system. With your participation, with your active participation, ethical responsibilities followed, we can achieve more through pharmacovigilance and ensure patient safety. Thank you very much for listening. Um, so, uh didactic lecture is going to be taken by Dr. Eric, who is a senior lecturer at the School of Pharmacy, University of Nairobi. He's a registered pharmacist, having received um, his Bachelor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Nairobi. He has gone on to receive his PhD in medicinal chemistry and pharmacology from the University of Cape Town. He has brought expertise and research interest, a strong interest in early stage drug um, discovery research, aimed at identifying hit and miss compounds of interest that could feed the drug discovery pipeline for infectious diseases, particularly malaria. Um, he's very, you know, we have his biography here um, and he's um, a member of several pharmacovigilance expert advisory committees and really skilled in what his, uh, he does and is a great, um, you know, re um, resource person to speak to us on today's topic. Um, a warm welcome to Dr. Eric as he takes us through his presentation. Um, uh, thank you very, very much for that, for that kind introduction. I hope you can hear me clearly. We hear you yes, loud and clear, Eric. Ah, brilliant. Yes, I can hear you very clearly. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, so again, my name is Dr. Eric Gontai, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here um, um, to speak to you in this second session, the didactic session on pharmacovigilance systems in Africa. And this is a session that I will present alongside my colleague, Dr. Aiwak, who will take you through probably the second half of this, of this uh, presentation, but she'll be introduced uh, separately. So if you can just move to the next slide, just to set the stage for what's to come. Uh, we want to talk about pharmacovigilance systems, yes, country pharmacovigilance systems. And so we'll begin, of course, with definitions, but we'll begin uh, by highlighting the important aspects of a pharmacovigilance system, the important pillars 
of our pharmacovigilance system. And then we'll get into each of those pillars using Kenya and Nigeria as examples, for Africa, as representative examples for Africa, yes? And then thereafter, my colleague will then take you through what PV looks like in a hospital facility. So hopefully by the end of this session, uh, it should be very clear what our country PV system is and where we can participate in this country PV systems and, and where we are as far as uh, Kenya and Nigeria are concerned as representative countries from, from Africa, all right? Good. So this definition has already been given to you by Dr. Martha and also by Petrus. And so I'm not going to repeat this. What I'm going to use this slide for is just to make the point that all these PV activities that we're speaking about, all the detection, the reporting, the assessment, the communication, they have to occur within a framework. Yes, and it is that framework that we're calling the PV system. And so different countries have different pharmacovigilance systems that they've put in place, but there are certain key common pillars that each of these PV systems should have, and we shall be examining what they are and using the relevant examples from Kenya and Nigeria to show actually how they look like in a real practical setting, yes? So this is the, the, the objective, pharmacovigilance, and we want to present the framework around which these activities occur, all right? Uh, so next slide, please. So this is one way of looking at what a national PV system is all about, yes? As you can imagine, you talk about a system, you're talking about all the institutions and all the players, if you like, that contribute towards a particular activity and a particular objective. And that also applies for a PV system. These are all the institutions and organizations and resources and staff and infrastructure that are used in totality to support the PV activities in a country, yes? And so what I've highlighted in the, in the, in the diagram at the bottom there, are what I consider and what has been actually outlined by the WHO to be the key pillars of a PV system. So I'll take time just to go through each of these because these are the ones that we're going to be highlighting using African examples, yes? So we need, first of all, a national pharmacovigilance uh, center. This is the hub that coordinates all PV activities within the country. And all information that is generated through PV should be channeled to them and, and, and through them through to uh, global um, uh, uh, databases, yes. So national PV system will be examining whether or not we have a national PV system in countries in Africa using Kenya and Nigeria as an African setting. Yes, another key important aspect is this reporting system, the spontaneous reporting system. Now, as we mentioned quite a lot of times that there's a lot of reporting going on. Uh, Beatrice alluded to the fact that a lot of these reports are generated at facility level and one way or another, they must be transmitted to national level for collation and assessment. And the system that supports that is what you're calling a reporting system. And as you can imagine, this is a cornerstone of any PV system, how efficient, what are the methods available for reporting, uh, uh, for transmitting PV reports, yes? We also need a database, a national database, where we collate all this information generated from all these facilities and, and collate that and analyze that, and sometimes even transmit that to global uh, databases, yes? Now, another important component of the PV system, and this actually supports the PV system, are advisory, expert advisory committees, yes? Uh, we talk a lot about the assessment and the recommendations that arise from pharmacovigilance reports. These advisory committees are, committees are there to support that. They review data coming through. In many instances, they review individual cases and they offer recommendations and guidance on how to proceed from there. So advisory committees ideally should be there to support PV systems. And we shall see whether that is actually the case in, in African setting. And finally, we need communication strategies. We've talked a lot about the flow of information to the National PV Center. There needs to be information flowing from the National PV Center to stakeholders who need to, to, to hear or to, to consume such information. And so there must be communication strategies in place and we shall see what those are in our setting. So this gives a nice outline, a nice uh, framework for our discussions today. Um, next slide, please. This is a different way. Um, sorry, uh, some of the, 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 the traffic seem to have moved, but this is a different way of saying exactly the same thing. We need structures, systems, and roles to be clear and things like PV guidelines and advisory committees and, and, and staff and the like. Staff and infrastructure, yes, that also constitute part of the PV system, the staff and, and the reporting systems and the communication systems that we've spoken about. Of course, the people who are involved in this need some skills, and these are skills that are gained through pre-service and in-service training. 
And they, of course, the tools at their disposal, we've seen already some of them, the reporting tools and so on and so forth. So this is also a different way of looking at exactly the same thing. I included this slide because this is a very common infographic that you'll see in many, in many fora. And it also speaks to the same pharmacovigilance. It's not a different pharmacovigilance system. It's the same pharmacovigilance system that you're talking about. And it also gives us a structure that we shall approach the rest of our discussion now. Okay, so let's get into uh, the next slide, please. Let's get into what we see with selected African countries as representatives of the rest of the continent. So in Kenya and in Nigeria, of course, you've already noted that we do have national pharmacovigilance uh, centers. So that ticks that first box, the all important box. Do you have a national PV center to coordinate PV activities in the country? And the answer is yes, for these two countries and for many other African countries. Yes, in Kenya, it is housed, the National Pharmacovigilance Center is housed in the Medicine Regulatory Authority, Pharmacy and Poisons Board, as you've heard from Dr. Martha. And in Nigeria, the counterpart, NAFDAC, which is their Medicines Re uh, Regulatory Authority, also houses their Pharmacovigilance Division under the PVPMS Directorate. So that ticks that first box. Yes, yeah, so we can draw some comfort from the fact that we do have PV centers dedicated for this purpose in, in African countries, yes. Next slide, please. So now we go into specific details about different aspects of, of, of the PV systems and how they look like in the, different, in the different countries. So we've already ticked the box for national PV centers. These are present. And one thing that we need to point out is that Nigeria, and this of course arises uh, partly, I'm sure, due to the sheer size and population of Nigeria. In addition to having the national PV center, they also have their zonal PV centers, yes, um, serving different regions of the countries yeah, of the country. And as you can imagine, these then support in terms of implementing activities and channeling information. They support the national PV center, yes. So this is an additional aspect which we do not see in Kenya. It may be replicated in other African countries. So in addition, and this, this is, is a strength in my opinion, in addition to having the national PV center, they have zonal PV centers, yes, that serve different regions of the country. This, this is, I think, is an interesting idea that may be replicated in other, in other countries, yes. Now, let's look at other important components of, of, of these structures and systems uh, in the national PV uh, system, yes. One key aspect of PV in, from a national point of view is pharmacovigilance activities in national programs. And you see both countries are quite strong on this. Now, these national programs, of course, are these programs that are run from a national level, but which serve specific public health purposes, yes. So, for example, in Kenya, we have the HIV program, we have a TB program, we have a malaria program, we have the vaccines program. And in each of these programs is an important and, and, and very strong PV component. So that is an important component of the national PV system, because as you can imagine, these programs serve a good proportion of the population. They serve important public health uh, considerations, and therefore any PV uh, data that they can generate will go a long way to uh, supporting the national pharmacovigilance activities. Yes, the same can be said for Nigeria. So this again ticks that box that we have leveraged on the presence of national programs to further the PV agenda, to further the PV activities, yes. Of course, the classic, uh, shall we say, uh, site of PV, especially PV report generation, is the facilities. And in my opinion, this is where we probably have some improvement to do, pharmacovigilance activities at facility level, yes. Um, we see quite a bit of that, especially in referral hospitals and county hospitals and major private hospitals. But in my opinion, this is this probably can be considered as a challenge to all of us, is that many facilities do not yet participate actively in pharmacovigilance activities. Yes, remember it is at these facilities that patient meets drug, that the medical product or the medication meets the patient. And most of these PV concerns arise at that point. And it is important that we recruit as many facilities as possible in PV activities to generate these reports and transmit them onwards. Yes, I think there's significant room for improvement. And hopefully at the end of these talks, many of us who come from facilities may be interested in either supporting or actually establishing PV activities in our uh, different uh, facilities. Of course, there's a role played by market authorization holders who have to make mandatory uh, reports, adverse drug reaction reports, yes. 
So we tick most of the boxes, but with regard to PV in, in facilities, we there's still room for improvement in Africa, yes? Next slide, please. Yes. So then we ask ourselves the next question. Do we have expert advisory committees in place in these African countries and are there guidelines and protocols in place? And the answer is yes. Guidelines and protocols have already been alluded to by both speakers before me. Uh, there are quite a number of guidelines to support PV activities in all these countries. And so this is a plus, a very strong plus, yes? There's a strength in my opinion, yes? In terms of expert advisory committees, these are also in place. In Kenya, for example, we have the Pharmacovigilance Expert Review Advisory Committee and the National Vaccine Safety and Advisory Committee. And in Nigeria, we have the National Drug Safety Advisory Committee as well. So these expert committees are there and they are functional and they are supporting the PV activities. So this is, is, is also a, a strength uh, of the African national PV systems. Yes? Good, uh, next slide, please. So again, the next question is, do we have dedicated staff? The answer, of course, is yes. So again, we tick another box as far as having complete wholesome uh, uh, national PV uh, systems is concerned. We have dedicated staff manning this national and in the case of Nigeria, also the zonal uh, pharmacovigilance centers. Um, the two countries are also very strong on communication strategies. Remember, we talked about closing the loop, having data or information flowing from the PV center to stakeholders, to consumers, to the public, actually. Yes, we have newsletters, periodic newsletters from both um, uh, uh, regulatory authorities and the PV centers. We have uh, emails, what we call e-shots, uh, that uh, the Pharmacy and Poisons Board also, also uh, facilitates. We have uh, social media. We've already seen an example by Dr. Martha, some social media engagement, um, journal articles and, and reports and that sort of thing. So there is a deliberate and consistent effort by these two uh, national pharmacovigilance centers. And I expect this to be replicated in others to inform, to communicate, to share information with other stakeholders and the general public as the case uh, may be. So this is also um, uh, quite satisfying to see. Um, next slide, please. So we've also heard of these uh, reporting systems. Yes. So the question would be, do we have uh, efficient reporting systems, ways of transmitting information from programs and from the facilities to the national PV centers? And the answer is, is yes. Different platforms, yes. We have the electronic platform, of course, you can imagine everything is going electronic these days. And so there are electronic platforms, both from the Pharmacy and Poisons Board, what you've seen from Dr. Martha is the PV electronic reporting system. And we have a similar platform also on the NAFDAQ website. So it is available. Health care workers like ourselves can make reports. Members of the public too can make uh, reports. Yes, and it is important that they are also aware of this. Yes, so the reporting systems are present. They are also they have the old school, if you like, way of making these reports. Hard copy reporting forms are present. Uh, you can download PDF forms and print and fill manually. Uh, most facilities may feel this is the way to go. That is also an option uh, that is there. Yes, and it is good to note that both countries. Again, we're talking about this as a representative of African countries, have data management systems, and they usually push all these reports and they support the global pharmacovigilance efforts uh, that are coordinated by the WHO Uppsala Monitoring uh, Center. So again, we are strong on that. Um, so that's, that's, that's also quite satisfying uh, to see, yes. Uh, next slide, please. So, in terms of training, and this might be relevant to many of us here, yes? You may be asking yourself, in my facility, in my present uh, place of work, how can I participate? How can I become part of this PV system? And if I need additional training, is it possible to get such training? And the answer is yes. Both countries are quite strong on the training that they offer, both pre-service and in-service training. Yes, the curricula are there, the manuals are there. I know for a fact that there are efforts to conduct regular trainings of relevant stakeholders in facilities and, and other health care uh, institutions. Um, so if you are interested in participating and you'd like to know more, you'd like some formal training in pharmacovigilance, all you need to do is simply reach out to your relevant regulatory authority and they can organize, I'm sure, through um, the institution um, uh, for you to get that, yes? Pre-service training is also available. Postgraduate training, which is, uh, well, not really new, but uh, relatively new 
entrant yes where we are training specific experts in pharmacovigilance we have such uh, courses at the university of nairobi a master's level so you can actually if you're interested uh, pursue uh, there are very many options there's a point we're making in terms of getting training for pharmacovigilance yes and finally going to the next slide so this, this I'm not going to repeat. You've already been uh, told time and time again that there are tools, reporting tools are available. So this ticks that box as far as a component of pharmacovigilance is concerned. Yes. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. So I'd like to finish my 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 short talk now. Uh, by saying that, yes, first of all, we highlighted the different pillars of the national PV systems. And it does look, at least by examining the Kenyan and the Nigerian pharmacovigilance uh, systems, that we have very strong national PV systems. Yes, we have very strong national PV systems. There is some room for improvement, particularly with regard to recruiting, to increasing the activity at facility level. And hopefully many of you will leave here with that note that yes, probably I can get my institution to participate or I can support it if it's already present. And so I leave you with a call that you should consider yourself, if you're a healthcare worker in a particular facility, you should consider yourself to be part of the national PV system. If you'd like additional training that is available, and uh, I'm hoping, and this is for, for the organizers of this particular forum, that we shall have many more interactions and probably go into greater detail, probably a bit more time into the various aspects of PV that people can, can participate in, yes? So this is just to whet your appetite and that you can participate actively in, in, in pharmacovigilance, yes? So I'd like to hand over now to my colleague to then uh, take you through what PV looks like from a facility setting. So thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Guantai, for that uh, excellent presentation. We'll just go immediately to, I want to hope that you can hear me clearly. We'll go immediately to just looking at how does PV look like in a hospital facility. So the scope of PV is quite wide. I'm going to focus on two areas, medication errors and quality issues, because these have an impact on therapeutic failure, in addition to contributing to adverse uh, to the next slide, uh, Wale, or yes. So there are a number of pharmacovigilance activities you can take part in in our hospital facility. And uh, the, uh, uh, I've highlighted two, uh, the reporting and collecting of reports related to poor quality medicines and adverse drug reactions, the suspected events, as well as medication error reporting. The rest have been highlighted in terms of healthcare worker sensitization, uh, EFI reporting and supporting investigations. When we have ADRs and EFIs and the National uh, Pharmacovigilance Center comes to report, we give that uh, uh, support. Now, when we look at identification of quality issues, it's important that besides completing the forms, if you have those tools, that the person responsible for pharmacovigilance in your facility can be able to support and ensure that there's corrective action. This can be a product recall or a batch replacement. Uh, now, some of the issues that can arise could be, you can notice changes in batches, like this is an example of warfarin. One was slightly white, one was slightly pink, and they arrived at the hospital at the same time. Others are issues that you can easily point out, like maybe bottles which are not uh, half full. So this is an example of one of the, one of the high cost medications that only came half full. So where, where is our role? All of us, uh, I'm sure that we are a number of healthcare workers on this call, there's a point which you play a role, whether it's in selection, procurement, distribution, or use. Now, to the next slide, we look closely at medication use cycle. The next slide. Yes, so there are a number of steps when it comes to medication use, and anything can go wrong in any of these steps, whether it's a dispensing, administration, prescribing. And now as we look at examples of where this can go wrong, I want to highlight uh, an example in the next slide. Uh, thank you, Wale, if we move to the next slide. Yes, so we look at now there are medication errors that can take place. Like this is an example of where the chlorhexidine for cord care was actually administered as an eye drop to a patient. If you go to the slide just before this, there's what we call the safety strategies. 
the five rights for medicine administration. And besides what we have always known in terms of identifying the right patient and giving them the right instructions, we need to make sure that we've also communicated very clearly. We proceed forward to look at also an example of dispensing errors that can occur from poor communication of instructions. Uh, thank you, if you can progress down to the slides. Um, the one who's the DJ manning the slides, if you could progress down. We want to look at an example of dispensing errors that can occur at a health facility, which can arise from failing to, to actually also communicate clearly to the patient. Yes, move forward again. Uh, who's running that? Please uh, proceed to see the example of dispensing errors. And we want to be sure that even when we are dispensing to the patients that we have managed to communicate clearly and when we identify an error, we do have a system for reporting these medication errors. Uh, I think the slides have hung, the one manning the slides. So I'll just proceed. So I want stop to ask... stop sharing and share again? Sorry about that. Um, okay. We will just pause sharing and then we share again. Thank you. Okay. As that is happening, I'd like us to think to ourselves, if you've had a scenario like what I've uh, projected before, have you, has there been an incident where medication was not uh, communicated clearly to the patient? So we need to go to the, yes, a scenario like that where medication was not communicated clearly to the patient and therefore they used it the wrong way. We're moving ahead. We can also look at dispensing errors. Uh, progress the slides. We can look at also the dispensing errors. Is this the way that we routinely uh, label our medicine for the patients? Are we sure they've understood? Have we communicated? And when we find a patient comes back with an issue, what is our system? So if we move ahead and we ask ourselves, what is the medication error reporting system do we have? And even when we identify errors, do we have a just culture where it is a blame-free environment to be able to learn from this? And now when we learn, we start thinking, what interventions can we put in place to reduce the likelihood of these errors? So we can give the example of communication. If we progress to the next slide, we can give the example of communication. You can use whatever channels that you have. WhatsApp is very common. Then also in your dispensing errors, you could consider putting up very clear guideline of what exactly do you expect? What's, what do you anticipate? I have the uh, fortune of working in a referral, a teaching facility, and therefore it's because of the high turnover of students. Sometimes repeating uh, might not be, might be difficult. So just having very clear uh, instructions of what is expectation. So moving ahead and also looking at what could be the potential situations that can cause errors. Some examples of this are having look-alike, sound-alike medicine. The Grayscale uh, slide shows eye drops. These eye drops actually came in this color, a bit gray, but difficult to differentiate. So, what can you do to make sure you reduce errors? If you can move ahead, you'll be able to see examples of cautionary labels. As we progress the slides, you can see examples of cautionary labels that we can use. We may be in a facility that being able to change the medication that we have in stock is not as easy, and therefore, you need to find other systems that can be able to support safe medication use. Um, if you can move the slides. Yes, that's an example of the question label. Then we proceed now to look at high alert medicine in the next slide. Why we are very keen on high alert medicines as uh, the definition will be projected as we move to the next slide. It's, these are medicines which bear a heightened risk of harm. That means when you have an error, whether it's a dispensing administration, then the risk of, harm, of patient harm is significant, including death. And what are these medications? We have the insulins, the opioids, you can see the list. The anticoagulants are concentrated electrolytes. So what do we do? It's important to identify these medicines. And I, in the next slide, you will see an example of a chart that in our facility, we have circulated to all the clinical areas. We can project the next slide to see the charts uh, of what has been shared to all clinical areas. And besides just giving the list of medicine, at the bottom of the chart, this is not very visible, but you give actual strategies of what is expected of healthcare workers in that area to be able to reduce the likelihood of their being harm when they are interacting with this medicine. Sometimes it's as simple as putting the label, also clear instructions, avoiding abbreviations. And when you're procuring, you need to consider what strengths of medicines do you have, and you need to also alert the teams to be aware that there are changes 
in the either strengths or their appearance so that you can reduce likelihood of harm. So as I finish, and when just to just from what it is we've learned in terms of the PV systems and what we have in place, that if we want to effect change in our facilities, that we know that this uh, it has to be intentional. We cannot just expect that suddenly we'll have a working system. We need to be intentional. So um, yes. So thank you, and I think with that we'll be open to questions regarding any issues or concerns you'd like to raise with regards to how do you implement systems similar systems in your facility. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Darcy Iwak. We just heard from Dr. Darcy Iwak. Um, she is a pharmacoepidemiologist with over 15 years of hospital pharmacy experience. Um, she has a bachelor's, um, a bachelor of pharmacy and a master of pharmacy from the University of Nairobi. So we have heard from an expert who deals with this on a daily basis. We're very excited to have her on, on, on this it present during this session. She's also a member of the Medicine and Therapeutic Committee Secretariat. She's secretary to the, to the Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee among other responsibilities in multidisciplinary teams. Thank you so much, Dr. Iwak. Um, we will be sharing any questions that come in the chat um, so that you can answer them as we go along. Um, we will just quickly move on to the next um, thing on the agenda. We have a case presentation um, and we will be sharing, can you move to the next slide? And to, to go to take us deeper into some of the the key aspects of patient safety. Using specific examples and case studies, we will be welcoming Dr. Abimbola Opadei. She is a consultant physician and a clinical pharmacologist. She's a fellow of both the West African College of Physicians and the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria. She has done extensive research within this space and has over 20 scientific publications and presentations. She is also a senior lecturer with the University of Benin City in Nigeria. She teaches clinical students pharmacology and pharmacovigilance. So we're very happy to have her. Um, on this call during this session to take us even deeper into the topic. Over to you, Dr. Bimbola. Thank you, Adara, for the introduction. And I thank all the previous speakers. So for the next couple of minutes, I will be discussing practical pharmacovigilance and I'll use the next outline. Next, Wally. Okay, so there's a picture where I'd like to show you now that describes to me the medicine situations in Africa, where we have a large pharmaceutical market, large population, and yet we don't have enough attention to drug safety. Next. And to me, it seems as if we're jumping into the ocean without having a life jacket or even knowing how to swim. So it's important for us to learn about pharmacovigilance. Why do we need to know about pharmacovigilance? Because when medicines are being developed, you don't know enough about what it can do in the open market. You don't have any idea what it can cause. And so our aim is to detect what we call signals where we are reporting information about an event, an adverse event and a drug and the relationship that it can cause. And especially when we don't know the previously unknown reactions to this particular drug. So why again do we have to have pharmacovigilance? because healthcare professionals provide a lot. If you're looking at the picture on the right, this was what happened in the 1950s when lots of women in the developed world used a drug called talidomide and they came down with seal like limbs, the children. And it was a doctor, an obstetrician in Australia who said, have you been seeing this in your practice? And this part of global world safety as we know it now. It's not restricted to only the developed world. In Nigeria, we have all had reports where over 100 children died from a misconstituted titan powder where propylene glycol was given to them and they died. Different cases of drug disaster and this dots the landscape. Even in Kenya, a couple of years ago, some women used a herbal contraceptive and their children ended up having precocious puberty. So even herbals 
are not so safe as people may imagine. Next slide. So this is the kind of situation we have in Africa that makes it important for us to monitor. A lot has been said about reporting, but what I want you to take away is that spontaneous reporting is what the healthcare professional can do. These are the kind of reports that you can really bring. There are other types which you can participate in, intensified ADR reporting, targeted reporting, but the common ones we see, the common reactions we see are spontaneous where all the medicines that the patient is exposed to, all the reactions can be reported to a global database next, which is for us, we usually use the WHO uh, Program for International Drug Monitoring Database, also known as VigiBase. Next. So again, for all these other types of monitoring, it's mostly targeted by looking at new medicines, all medicines ideally for developing pharmacovigilance systems should be followed up. Next. Next slide. So important terminologies for us to take note of. An adverse drug reaction. Now this is a, a response to a drug which is noxious and unintended. Two keywords there. It should be harmful or uncomfortable to the patient and is unintended. This is not what you want the drug to do. You're taking a medicine, you want to take it, for example, an antihistamine, and it causes severe sedation. You are not taking it for the sedation. You're taking it because you have uh, rhinitis, for example. And this is an adverse drug reaction. This is key to this presentation. Then we have adverse event for immunization. I think we should take note of this now, where we have untoward medical occurrences following adverse event for immunization. And this is also very common. This is what we have seen now commonly because of the COVID-19. This pandemic. one now your, Next. Now your lecturer, maybe. Then we have serious adverse what drug is? reactions. And serious adverse drug reactions are reactions that will result in death. These ones are life-threatening they result in hospitalization. It's very important to know that serious adverse drug reaction, they attract more attention because of the risk of fatality. And of course, this is what has part of, like I said, the global world safety, uh, drug safety as we know it. Next slide. So I'll present to you a case. This is what we see. A 52 year old man, um, the robot extract, he had hypertensive heart failure and he was given lysinopril, which is an angiotensin compounding enzyme inhibitor was giving furosemide, aspirin, digoxin, all of this to help him. And he did, he did feel better. He went to and came back two days later with swollen lips. He had a lower face swelling of about 10 days, 10 hours duration with difficulty in swallowing. So the diagnosis was that he had an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor induced angioedema. The drug was discontinued and the patient recovered. So this is typical. You give a drug, the patient has a reaction, we gave the drug before the reaction, and this is what we determine as an adverse drug reaction. This was actually a case report by Adibayo and Ali Bishu. Next. So is this common? Yes, it is common, not just in the developed world, but also in Africa. 2.6% of hospital-related emergency visits were drug-related in a study we conducted in our center over a four-year period. And this has also been shown in different studies around Africa. So it's not just a world or developed world problem, it's here with us in Africa. And so we have to pay attention to it. Next slide. So the factors that can predispose a patient towards developing these adverse directions, they have a plethora. I'll just highlight a few. For the patient, now we have a lot of our patients, elderly patients, their children, they traveled and they send them medicines. Oh, my dad is at home, he has hypertension. You don't know your dad's physician, you don't know the medicine is on, but you have access to some medicines overseas and they send these medicines down to their parents, multivitamins, uh, different herbal supplements, not knowing the kind of interaction. And the patients say, oh, my daughter sent me medicine, I must use it. And they develop an adverse drug reaction to medicines that we cannot even pronounce or spell because it's another language. Again, comorbid situations, multiple physicians. Patients do a lot of doctor shopping. I see Dr. A, Dr. B, Dr. C. Then the medicine itself. Now, the medicine itself also can cause reaction by virtual of how it is. And you really can't tell which medicine 
will cause a reaction in a patient. It's impossible to tell until the patient takes it. Then the prescriber, you are given a medicine, you don't know the pharmacology, you're not sure if you can uh, compound it into a liquid form before giving it to the patient. Should it be taken with food, without food? Should it be taken on an empty stomach? Should you give it IV or IM? Can it be put on a piggyback? You can't tell because you have not known enough about the medicine. So it's important for prescribers to also know you also can contribute to the development of an adverse drug reaction. Next. So what else can we do to ensure that all these cases are adequately reported? The most important thing is you should know that there are different types of adverse drug reactions. You have the type A and type B. This is the classic classification. And for the type A, it's related to the pharmacology of the drug. What can the drug do? What is it supposed to do? And this, the morbidity is high, but the mortality, not so many would die from type A. Um, you can trace it to the pharmacology of the drug. It's usually dose dependent, and it can be reproduced in animal models. But for the type B, it's bizarre. You just can't explain it. And the mortality is also high. There may not be any known animal models, and it could be due to a metabolite. There are examples of type A and type B. For example, you give naproxen. With naproxen, you have gastrointestinal hemorrhage. This is known. It can also cause a granulocytosis. So for every drug, there's a possibility, depending on your genetic makeup, uh, that you can have either a type A or a type B from the pharmacology of the drug. Next slide. Next, next slide. And the slide after this. So how do you recognize that your patient has developed an adverse drug reaction? Because it can mimic other diseases. It could be due to, it could look like the disease that you are even treating. We see this a lot calling anti-malarials. She says, oh, I've taken malaria medications for three days and I have a fever on the third day. Some anti-malarials cause severe asthenia such that the patient feels worse after using the medicine than starting it. It is an adverse drug reaction. It should be reported. You should find out why did the patient stop the medicine? Why did you reduce the dose? You screen all medications. Once your patient comes to you for any kind of problem, ask, are you on? Take a good history. Find out why are the lab results abnormal? That could just be the beginning of you solving the patient's problem. And you have regular chart reviews for hospitalized patients. Next. So in treating this patient, you should ensure that you take a good history, you examine the patient appropriately. And for the history, find out when did you take the medicine? Can you time it to the medicines? Can you time the drug to the reaction? Um, you should also find out other things. Which kind of reaction is this patient presenting with? Enable, enable to enable you describe properly what the patient has had. Then try to find out the relationship in terms of time to the medications the patient has had, and of course you would investigate. How do you treat? You should stop the medicines if it's a non-essential one. You should stop it. If you cannot stop it, then you should reduce the dose if it's the one that you can reduce the dose. Next slide, Wally. And of course, you should consider alternative medicines if it's available or any possible, is this, is this a possibly drug interaction? Is another medicine responsible for these reactions that we are seeing? Then you should also think about stopping slowly, gentle withdrawal, not just abruptly, because this can cause more problems. And you must always monitor the progress of the patient. Next slide. Should you rechallenge? Ethically, it may be wrong. You may not get any additional information, and the patient may actually die. You're trying to give the drug again. There may be no reason why. You may just have sensitized, the patient may have just been sensitized for the first time he had the reaction, the second time he just lifted it. So it's really not right to reach a range unless the patient had done it and is reporting to you. Next slide. Again, how do you report? This has been discussed, different reporting formats using the e-reporting channel, MedSafety app. And then in Nigeria, there's a rapid alert system for consumer reporting, also known as PRASCO. Next slide. And for the PRASCO, uh, you send a USSD uh, short code. You send your reports to a USSD short code, and this is what. 
The mess safety app has also been uh, highlighted by previous speakers, so I won't go through that. But important to note that this is new. About 11 countries in Africa are presently using the med safety app in Ghana, Botswana, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. So it's really quite, it's getting ground. And you can download it. You can have offline reporting. And you can send it at your own convenience, but you must always register. And you can even get medicine safety information from it. So it's a two in one app. You can also report uh, adverse event following immunization. So it's really quite good and useful. You can get it from Google Play Store or the Apple Store. Next. Next slide, Wally. Wally. This is the Prasco, like I said, and you can send your complaints to 2050 for free. Next. Reporting guidelines. So this is available for most countries um, that are in the pharmacovigilance program. And I just highlighted a few, Liberia, Kenya, Nigeria, even the WHO. Now this guide tells you how you can detect and report adverse drug reaction. And you can get uh, your country's guidelines from the WHO website, WHO UMC website, at the bottom right of the slide. Next. The important things that you must report. First, the patient's details. You must note the patient's age, name, weight, sex, and where is the patient being treated. The details of the reaction, when it started, when it stopped, the outcome, did the patient die? Because you want to determine if it was a serious reaction. The product itself, because sometimes there's quality issues. So you should note the manufacturer's details, the product details, when the drug was started, when it was stopped, how it was used, the route, and of course, you, the healthcare professional, you are the reporter. So you should fill in your details and do not worry. Your details, this is a confidential form. Nothing will happen to your details because it's going straight to the National Pharmacovigilance Center. It's not for third party use. Next slide. I give you another case. Now, this was a 27 year old man who was brought into the hospital because two days before he had been uh, paranoid, he had been verbally aggressive, and somebody had helped them and given the man haloperidol and diazepam. Then he came down with difficulty in swallowing, painful contraction of his neck muscles, involuntary tongue contusion. So I ask you, is this an adverse drug reaction or a continuation of what happens to be psychosis? This is an adverse drug reaction because he had taken the medicines before he developed this part of the reaction. Next slide. If you are going to report that particular case, remember we had his name, we had his age, 27 year old man, we had his initials. We had the reaction which he had difficulty in uh, tongue protrusion and the likes. Then did we have the suspected drug was on aloperidol and diazepam. And of course we could choose, because he took the two together. So we choose one, drug details, aloperidol, um, concomitant medicines, diazepam. And you will fill in your details as the reporter. Next slide. Next. Then this other case. Now, this is a 67 year old pensioner who had an exfoliating skin rash five days after starting a new medication given to him by his new physician. He had other physicians, he didn't disclose. And then goes ahead and takes these new medicines twice daily at a very, well, it's not the highest dose, but a pretty, really high dose and develop progressive lip swelling and an exfoliative rash. So you now look, by the time he came, he was on a plethora of medicines. It was a metrotrictic, prednisolone, tramadol, hydroxyurea, bicatilamide, multivitamins, amlodipine, valsatan. I'm exhausted even just talking about it. So did he have an adverse drug reaction? Yes, but to which drug? Now you are confused. As a health professional, you are tempted to say, should I report? Uh, but I don't know what it has. The question is, should you report? The answer is yes, report. Because he has had a reaction to a new medicine that was given to him. It's also possible that he had a drug interaction. So this is not for you to determine, it's for you to report and for the experts to determine. Next slide. So when do you report? Report every time. Next slide. Who should report? Everybody can report. The patent, patent medicine dealers in Nigeria should report. Traditional medicine clinics, traditional birth attendants, nursing homes, patients. Everybody should report. Pharmaceutical companies because we're all involved in drug safety. Next. 
And what should you report on? Medicines, blood products, all the things that have been listed under the product consensus for macro vigilance should be reported. Everything can be reported. Medical devices as well. Next slide. And what are the scope? We've already had uh, reasons or different aspects. So acute and chronic poison should be reported. For patients who have substance misuse and abuse, it should be reported. We cannot truly really quantify things if we are not properly reporting. Adverse drug reactions that we've explained, substandard and falsified medicine quality issues, medication errors that has already been listed, it should be reported as well. Next. So what happens to my report? Your report goes to the zonal center if you have one, to the National Pharmacopoeilance Center, and then it goes to WHO International Database. And every report that goes to the WHO database is on, undergoes a process called signal detection, which I'll talk briefly about. Then it can lead to regulatory actions. It could cause withdrawal of that particular medicine. It could be banned. Eventually, it improves drug safety. Another common question we get is, is there any risk to reporting? Um, reporting is not an admission of you that you contributed to the, to the ad adverse drug reaction. So please feel free to report. It's taken on a case-by-case -case basis and it's not an admission of it. I'd like to reiterate that. Next slide. So it, at the WHO, like I said, all the reports that go there get through what we call a first-pass statistical screening. Then there's an initial manner assessment, an in-depth assessment, the decision on the signal, and of course, Whatever decision to they get regarding this unidentified, previously unknown reaction or not properly documented, it may have been there. This communication is now made available to national centers through Vigilite and it's also published in WHO Pharmaceutical Database uh, newsletter. So eventually, you all get to know about new signals that are developing following this new single report that you have sent to the WHO database. Next slide. So we did a study to find out why do people not report? Why don't they report? First they say, oh, well, we don't know um, the reporting routes. I'm not sure it's an adverse drug reaction. It could be the disease. I don't know how to report. I don't have time. Is it even legal to report? So Dr. Mr. Beatrice has already told us, yes, it is legal to report. Two, you can find the time because your single report may just save a thousand lives. Uh, we've already addressed that there's no litigation per se. And some people want more training. This is why this Tech Lab project is here, to give you more training about pharmacovigilance and to give you more information. Next slide. Next, Wally. So what is your responsibility towards adverse drug reaction reporting and pharmacovigilance? One, you must ensure that you know about the medicine that you want to give. You must prescribe rationally. You must dispense rationally. You must administer the medicines, right patient, right dose, right time, right route. Um, you should try and look out for adverse drug reactions. You should try and prevent it as much as possible. Know your pharmacology, know the medicine that you're about to give. Luckily, we don't use more than maximum 20 to 50 medicines. Try and know about them. Educate your patients about rational use of medicines. Advise them to, do, to stop doctor shopping, watch out for the medicines that they use. And as much as possible, document, 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 and report, because we can only save lives if we have a good number of reports coming from the healthcare professionals. So I'd like to acknowledge my mentor, Professor Ambrose Issa, who is also the chairman of the National Drug Safety Advisory Committee. Next slide, Wally. Wally. Uh, of NAFDAC and also the former head of the department of the Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics Department, University of Benin, Benin City in Nigeria. The present head of department, Dr. S.A. Ayimboa, and the training manual from the National Pharmacovigilance Center. And I thank all you all for your time. If you want further learning resources, next slide. Um, you can go to WHO UMC website. They have lots of resources there. Uh, there's also a global pharmacovigilance um, network, which has lots of resources for training. Uh, you can go to the EU2P and uh, pharmacovigilance education for universities from the University of Le the Lareb, Netherlands. Uh, and these are very good resources. I thank you all for listening. and I hope you have learned uh, a thing or two. Thank you.
Wow, thank you so, so much, Dr. Opadi. Thank you for breaking it down even to the point that we can understand for some of us who who this is new for us and we can say we're leaving the session with even more knowledge about patient safety and pharmacovigilance. Um, so we will be asking some of the questions that we have received in the chat. Um, so we would um, ask the question, Dr. Paddy, feel free to, to respond. And we'd also like Dr. Iwak and Dr. Guantai to please feel free to respond to the questions as well. So um, we have one question. Someone says, um, thank you, Dr. Paddy. Please, what are the deliberate steps we can take in ensuring adverse reactions to immunizations are reported? Okay, um, for adverse events following immunization, practical steps. Um, for healthcare professionals, it's encouraged that they download the MedCity app themselves and report. I mean, you can self, you can report your own reactions and you can report reactions of people around you. Then um, we'll also have ongoing uh, cohort event monitoring studies all around uh, just to see if there can be an increased uptake in the number of adverse event for immunization. There is a program um, that chats um, records of adverse event for immunization already. There are forms for this and they have a standard program for that already in most uh, immunization centers. So it's also encouraged that when a client takes any vaccine, if you have a reaction, you should go back to the immunization center and report. This form will be filled and will be transmitted to the appropriate authority, in this case, NAPTA. And also now, most of the immunization officers in Nigeria, particularly, have been trained on pharmacovigilance and how to recognize uh, immunization-related events. So, they are also encouraged to download the Med Safety app and report uh, in a timely manner. Well, this is uh, more of advocacy. You just keep telling the clients, if you have a reaction, please come back, tell us, and then we'll report it and we'll offer you as much help as we can as needed. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question. Um, I will just read out that question very quickly. In cases where the adverse reactions may be similar to the disease being treated, how do we determine whether or not repeating the drug may be rechallenging or not? In such cases, please do you advise clinicians simply change to an alternative medication? So if I, if I understand this question properly, um, someone is having an adverse reaction is similar to the disease being treated. And you're trying to determine, is this a reaction? Is this a disease? The first thing is go with your first instance. If you think it's an adverse drug reaction, the first thing is to do is report it. After you report it, now you want to treat the patient. If you think it's, a real, it's from the drug, you are not certain, you can withdraw that drug. With a drug that you can comfortably withdraw or you can reduce the dose. That's the first thing. And possibly look for an alternative. While you are doing that, you will continue investigating your patient for the disease. So for example, because this happens a lot uh, with the anti-malaria. Some people take anti-malaria and they have very severe malaria and say, oh, I still have malaria. You know, we encourage you. While you have finished your course of anti-malaria, you should get yourself retreated just in case you have a recrudescence or a relapse and you may need to be retreated, but you can't do that until it's after seven days anyway. So in the interim, get yourself properly evaluated. There may be need for you to refer the patient to a bigger center. If you are in a primary healthcare center, you may need to refer to a tertiary center. You may need to run particular investigations so that you know that there is no alternative diagnosis at this point that you are entertaining, or there's another one that you think, okay, maybe we could try this. But as much as possible, withdraw the draw, stop it if you can, look for an alternate diagnosis. And if the patient needs another medication, then you can give. But usually I advise that you thoroughly evaluate the patient all over again. Go back to the basics and reevaluate. Thank you. Dr. Iwak, did you have any contributions to that or any additions to that? I know that you work um, in 
the the within the healthcare um, facilities proper. So, do you have any additions to to what um, Dr. Padei has said? Uh, okay, I could probably just add uh, one of the things we have done to encourage healthcare workers to report is make it a, also a performance evaluated um, objective that you actually need to, because we don't expect any patients will come and to, you'll not identify even one adverse effect or uh, um, mitigation error, and you'll always find that issue. So we've made it an objective that you must be able to look out for intentionally. Additionally, at the rollout of the COVID vaccine, because we know most uh, healthcare workers struggle with uh, documentation. So we made also simplified ways to document, then we follow up and get the, all the information that you require so that now you can uh, post the information to the National Pharmacovigilance Center. So they would get some basic information from them with a simple uh, Google form. And now this one we transfer it to the uh, national form. So probably just seeing how to simplify it and make it a, a performance related target. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question to, um, to Dr. To Dr. Guantai. Um, so there is this conversation around soliciting for adverse events. How, well, how do we find the balance between yes, reporting adverse events and um, the act of soliciting for these adverse events? Okay, so uh, my my understanding of that question is that your the soliciting is actually encouraging people to report ADRs, yes. And in my opinion, uh, there is there is no contradiction in terms there. Uh, the whole point of soliciting of of encouraging people to actively make this these reports is so that you can actually it also incre increases the, the vigilance for these adverse events. And it also increases the number of reports that we get because the more reports that we get, the more we can actually uh, deduce certain trends, especially for newly reported uh, adverse drug reactions. So in, in my opinion, I don't see a contradiction there. The soliciting simply means, maybe the term might have some negative connotations, but the, the, that simply means that we are encouraging people to actively report to actively report any adverse drug react, suspected adverse drug reactions that they come across. Thank you so much. There was a question in the chat. What is the role of retrospective reports of a AEs? And um, Dr. Paddy has responded to that question. She said retrospective reports are also valid and accepted. They are reviewed with context to time and vaccine. Thank you so much for that. Um, we would also like to hear from um, some, we know that in this in this session we have um, our healthcare providers um, across different facilities, and it would be good to hear um, if um, these um, guidelines are readily available in your facility. Do you have any systems or structures? I that during um, Dr. Guantai's um, session, he mentioned even um, paper-based. Um, um, forms to fill out these um, AEs. So I, I would like to throw the question open um, to our, our healthcare providers on the call. Um, do you have within your facility and would you like to share how um, you, the system that you have in place or the systems you would like to have in place um, when it comes to patient safety and pharmacovigilance? So please um, use the raised hand um, option and we will unmute you to share from your own experience. Whilst we wait for that, we have one of our wonderful um, hub experts on the call, Dr. Imosemi, um, who we would also want to hear from. He has been given a lot of insights on the chat and we would also like him to, to um, speak with us. Um, we, we also would, um, like Martha, Martha would also like you to contribute to, to this conversation to questions that I would still be reading out. So let's hear from Dr. Imosemi very quickly. Sir. Okay. Yeah, okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's appreciate all our uh, presenters for this fantastic talk. And let's also acknowledge you know, the, the topic for today, I think it's after school. In my opinion, I think it could have come at a better time. Um, I've 
sent across a number of comments. But just to say, the university where I practice, for example, um, each of the general hospitals, for example, is meant to, they are, they are meant to have a committee that is into drug, um, we call it SDRF, and then of course, uh, pharmacovigilance uh, operations and all that. You know, that was collecting information, documentation and all that. My, my take is that there has to be a lot of, there has to be increased sensitization advocacy about the importance of this. And the, the committee that is meant to exist in this hospital, I'm not too sure are very active. And that is because, you know, drug reactions, but that mild, you know, moderate or even severe that reaction, I'm not too sure are uh, regularly transmitted to either the department of pharmacy or even to the committee for collation. It's even more challenging in private hospitals, especially now when you do not even have enough hands as a lot of tax shifting and tax sharing. It is it's difficult depending on who is even running the clinic, who is, you know, to, for people to even recognize, you know, adverse drug reaction. I mean, I, I was opportune, I was chance to see a patient who, you know, on being treated, or was being treated for gastroenteritis, was given Maxolom, you know, just to Maxolom is metro, uh, metroclopramide, just to stop the vomiting among other things. And the next thing was that the patient presented with extra pyramidal side effects. The young medical doctor who, you know, was treating did not even see the link between metrocorporate and what the patient presented with. If that is known to me, I was able to unravel and highlight. So the, the, the way to go is to, first of all, sensitize. And I made a suggestion that her pharma, her pharma is a regulatory authority in, Niger in Lagos State, in Nigeria. What it does is to, you know, uh, annually uh, register hospitals, reaccredit and renew. One way to go is to increase the level of sensitization by encouraging a farmer to make it, I mean, documentation of such, team, of such adverse reaction or the practicalization or the industrialization of PV as a requirement. So that people are even conscious, there's an effort to document. I think if we start with a no name, no blame phenomenon, it's where people come out, help people to be more informed, more aware. And then the reporting process should be simplified. You know, we don't have enough hands, people are overwhelmed with numbers. Anything that requires, you know, a non simple method of documentation. It's not likely to see, you know. But I've sent all of these pieces of advice across, but great uh, choice of topic. Uh, I think there must be a way of either repeating it or letting people have access to this so that the culture, again, can be gradually, gradually ingrained and the process can be, you know, giving more vim, more energy and we'll get better and better. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mosemi. We are definitely going to share with everyone who is on. So today, oh, he had his. Yes, you have his hand on. Dr. Tide, please. Yeah, my, my hands are off, and uh, thanks for recognizing my hands to make comments. I think in terms of response from healthcare facilities, Dr. Mosseni has touched on many of the key points. The topic is very apt, and the reality of how practical this topic is on the background in the field is that it is more or less principle, not in practice. I think in my own primary care facility, the best of what pharmacophysical presence in my facility, just some few posters that I pick up from a, a, from a pharmaceutical shop once, highlighting the need for 
for reporting, and that is that is not more than that. So in practice, reporting advice about the action is not uh, is not yeah. is not common in day to day practice, particularly in small facilities like that is common everywhere. So as has been suggested, more advocacy, more more enlightening, and making the reporting simplified. Uh, and it's what is required to move on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, You know, it's important that we make it simplify very valid point. Um, it will make it easier for doctors to report this um, once it's simplified. Thank you. Very valid point. Um, thank you, everyone, for your contribution so far. It's been really engaging, and we've, we have we've learned a lot. Have one more hand up, Dr. Aymar. Okay, so that's Dr. Okay, I see Ambrose Issa's hand up. Please, Ambrose Issa, can you unmute and speak? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think let me uh, congratulate the speakers as well as the organizers for mounting uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, I want to appreciate you all because I think uh, by moves such as this, you find that we'll be able to close that gap, you know, regarding safety of medicines in Africa. I think we are making progress now. What I want people to realize is this, that when we fail, we can picture a doomsday scenario where a drug introduced by any company can be used by a large number of persons deployed by a number of persons, and at the end of the day, you find that they are all dead. This is what people don't think can happen. We saw what happened with thalidomide. We can have another thalidomide. And I can tell you, if thalidomide had been introduced in Africa, I wonder what would have happened, you know, uh, without the safety valves which was in place and which actually it triggered. So please keep up the good work. I uh, appreciate all the effort you have made. Please uh, maintain it. I'm delighted that uh, efforts in the past, uh, you know, is being taken up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Isa. Thank you for that early contribution. And thank everyone. It's been really engaging. So we'll have the post quiz up now um, to see what we've learned and what we've gained from the beginning of the session till now. Um, so still no pressure, just to, for you to assess um, your level of knowledge and what you've gained from the session. Thank you. We have the post quiz up. If you cannot see it, please signify um, by putting in a chat. Okay. The questions are up. The first question is the key terms in the definition of an adverse drug reaction is, and we have options. So please go ahead and click. Thank you. Okay, hoping to see some answers coming up. Okay. And the second question is pharmacovigilance is mainly about. So are we able to see the quiz? We can see. Yes, okay. yes, we can. Yes, we can. So no pleasures. We need to see some answers coming up so that we can proceed. Mm -hmm. It might be important to emphasize that we need to scroll down, go to the last uh, question. Yeah. So go to the next question. Yes, you just need to scroll down. While and the third question, the quiz, sorry. No, I just wanted Please to start. highlight that while taking the quiz, um, to look to find the recording um, in the chat, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel to find the recording and um, past recordings as well. Mm -hmm.